Um, we're going to continue today with uh, our testimonies. And I asked Benjamin if he would be willing to come up. And, and I actually asked him like a week and a half ago. And then I asked him at 1 o'clock this morning. <laughs> and he went... <laughs> But being that it was only 1 o'clock this morning, he had plenty of time to prepare. <laughs> so, Benjamin, if you would please come up. Okay, so, um, I was thinking about, uh, I was preparing for my, um, testimony speech this morning as I was getting in the car to come to church this morning. Um, I was thinking about what I was going to say and I was praying about it and I said, God's really just going to help me. And um, so I, like I always do when my great times of need, I open my Bible up and see what the verse of the day is. And it said something to the effect of, um, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer or something. Anyways, it had nothing to do with it, so I was just like, okay, well, whatever. So I turned on my radio, my Pandora radio, and um, the first song that came up, the title of it, was um, really, it pretty much shortened my entire testimony to one word. And I think it also shortens, if you're saved, it shortens your entire testimony down to one word as well. The name of the song was My Sanctus Real, the name of the song is Forgiven. And um, I just, just hit it. I mean, really, I mean, I've been forgiven. You know, when I think about really going through my day-to-day -day life, I don't think about it, but I really, I am not worthy of Jesus. Um, I've got a lot of sin in my past, in my life. I'm not like a, the kind of person that's come from a background of drugs and abuse and, you know, the party scene or anything like that. But I, you know, being raised in a Christian home, I was what, I was a Christian, some type of Christian my entire life. Like, at least for the first 14 years of my life, I would consider myself just an American Christian. Um, and I had plenty of sin in my life. And um, there was, uh, like I said, I was raised in a Christian home. My, my dad's the pastor here. And um, if you had asked me if I was going to go to heaven, I'd say, sure. Um, other than that, I didn't know anything. Not that knowledge is what saves. But uh, I didn't, I wasn't forgiven at that point. The forgiveness had been offered to me, but I had not really accepted it for myself. But I've been kind of writing my parents' you know, faith. But, um... You know, like, like I said, the whole, that word forgiven really wraps up my entire testimony, so, um, so there you go, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> as far as the course of events goes, um, I was about 14 at the time. There was a girl I really liked, and she had expressed no interest in me, and that really kind of broke my heart. Time, even though I wasn't older to date at the time. Um, I look back, I'm sure it's a silly thing, but at the time it was enough to really make ready the, the hardest, I guess, um, for me. So at that time I was, I was hurt. I was, it was basically just like I had put all my, uh, my house on the foundation of sand and all of a sudden it just washed away. And um, Shortly thereafter, because I was going to the youth group here at the time, and Trevor Ressize is the youth leader, we decided we were going to, our youth group had been planning to go to Creation, which is a Christian music festival out in Washington. Uh, that was 2006. So I went on that. I really didn't want to go on that because the girl I liked was going on that. I didn't want to have anything to do with it, but I went. I kind of kept to myself the whole time. I was quiet and shy and, and awkward and everything. And um, there was a kid who had come with us who wasn't part of the, our youth group at the time. He was coming from another uh, youth group. So he was late. Well, you guys probably know him. Um, but he was on fire for the Lord. He still is. Um, and I remember sitting around, we were camping, because what you do at creation, you camp, then you go to the concerts and stuff. But we were in between concerts, sitting around at the, the, uh, the camp, and he was just asking people, going around the circle, asking people, so how did you get saved? So the person would say, oh, I got saved back in so-and-so, and just telling her everything. Oh, that's pretty cool. And they came to me, and, you know, when did you get saved? How did you get saved? I'm like, well... I never really had a moment. I didn't have a you know exact time. I've just been a Christian all my life. And he very gently said, "Well, okay, well, I don't really think that means you're saved, but you know, okay, whatever." And I was like, "What? <laughs> Thanks for that." 
it was kind of weird. But he was really nice to me the whole time, and you know, it was good and everything. And then there was a, uh, a rule that Trevor had made, which makes sense, is he can't go anywhere without a buddy. Uh, but he obviously has to be of the same gender or anything like that. Um, so everybody got off doing their own things, you know, with their buddies. And um, the only person I had left to be with him with was, of course, Luke Lacey. So um, we decided to go, you know, there's a <coughs> band he really wanted me to see, is David Crowder, and that was going to be playing that night. Um, and then they were opening for a third day. Um, but it was still in the afternoon, so, or late afternoon, so we had a couple hours yet, so we just kind of wandered around and were talking to people and chatting, and, and he was very outgoing, so we'd just go and just talk to random people. You know, one time he saw these guys walking along down the road, and he was like, hey, how you guys doing? Nice to see ya. Turns out they were a band, and I was coming to sign autographs, and he didn't realize it. <laughs> but I remember buddy, it was kind of awkward. But, um, but yeah, he was very well known at concert, and it was kind of weird being around him, but um, it opened my eyes to what a person, you know, is really on fire for the Lord, and, you know, what the gift that he has, being an evangelist, that's, you know, you just can't stop him. And, um, we, so we went to the concert that night. There were a couple of guys with us um, that we had sort of picked up along the way. One's name was Shamal from uh, Michigan. The other guy's name was Gotten Boy. He was from Sudan, uh, which is very interesting. But we went and saw David Crowder Band. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard, oh, know what band that is or what their concerts are like or the songs or anything. They're very, they're very joyful and, and fun and um, very, a lot of praise of God and adoration for him. And, um, but it's upbeat and ex exciting, and they really get involved with the crowd, and they have the crowd get involved with each other and everything like that, and which is cool and everything, but I really think, at least in me, the Holy Spirit was moving. And um, it was, uh, something just happened. By the end of that concert, I was pumped. I was excited. You know, I mean, we were at the point now, um, we, had, we had a whistle that one of the bands had thrown out to the crowd, you know, with us, and um, so Luke Lacey had the whistle. We were running around the campus of creation, screaming how much we love Jesus. Just running around. I'll never forget that. Um, we just go up to a group of people randomly. It was dark out there, and then we just say, "On the count of three, I'm going to blow this whistle. And we're going to scream as loud as we can. And we love Jesus." So on, on three, one, two, three, he blow the whistle. And we just all go, "I love Jesus!" It's so loud. Just running around, hugging people, and, and saying hi to people, and just telling people about Jesus. And everything. It was. I had never done that. Before. Something very weird. And you know, it's one thing to have an emotional experience, it's another thing to have a, a spiritual experience. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish the two. But I think really the one that, you know, you can, time is the thing that tells the difference. Um, man, you know, that night, um, we went down to, to the, there was a third day concert going, they were almost done, but they were playing a song. And I can't remember what song it was, but um, it was enough for me to just, just I just got, kind of lay down on the ground and just kind of looked up at the sky because it was beautiful out there and everything. And, and Luke Lacey was over there too. And, and um, I just kind of looked over and I said, Luke Lacey, you know that moment you were talking about earlier? He's like, yeah. I said, I think that's this right now. Um, and so uh, we were kind of, after the concert, we were kind of walking around afterwards. And there was a lady there who um, said, there, she's a, one of the staff members there, said, you're doing baptisms the next day. I signed up for that. Um, I didn't know I was kind of nervous about it, but you know, decided, you know, Bible says to do it, so I'm gonna do it. Um, so the next day I was baptized. It was, uh, it was July 26th, and then I was baptized July 27th, 2009. Well, no, it was July 28th, it was July 29th I was baptized, sorry, 2006. But, um, there no God boy from Sudan, he also was baptized that day too, which was really cool. But it's just one of those things, I mean, I don't know what happened, but the Spirit just moved in me, and um, I, I don't know, I just changed. I didn't reach out for Jesus, He reached out for me. And I mean, like I said, I think that I was ready for it, because of what God brought me to at the time. And I was willing to accept it, and made a commitment to live my life for him at that time. And I suddenly found that all these sins I had been struggling with in my life, you know, private sins or just public sins that, you know, just anything, I suddenly had the power increasingly, not in and of myself, but because of Jesus, I had the power to overcome them. Increasingly. And that was incredible because I would try so hard by myself to overcome these sins, these temptations, and I could never do it. 
I was just, I returned to my vomit like a dog day after day, and nothing would ever change. Um, and I think finally, once the Holy Spirit was inside of me, and He was my leader, I was able to overcome, thanks to God. And I'm so blessed by that. I'm so blessed to have that in my life. And um, that word forgiven really just wraps up you know, all our testimonies, I think. And um, frankly, lately, personally, I've been going through kind of a dry spell in my walk with God. But as Lou Lacey's now wife pointed out to me when they were out visiting, when they were over, just think of the cross. And th think of what that is. Just really think about what the cross is. I mean, we talk about the cross all the time, but actually think about the cross. It's, it's so awesome. I mean, considering what I deserve, and what I, you know, how much I'm not worth it to me, at least. And apparently, God saw fit. Jesus says that God loves us just as much as He loves His Son. And that boggles my mind. And I just thank God so much for the cross. And so, I don't want you guys to think just because you're growing up in a Christian home or you're an American Christian that you're good to go because you're sending a life that are your master. And only Jesus can set you free from that. Because we're always a slave to something, and something's always our God. We just have to make sure that it is the one true God. Remember, He's our master. So, I guess that's my testimony. <laughs> Now I'm going to share his testimony from my perspective. <laughs> because he hit the nail right on the head when he talked about being an American Christian or what I call a cultural Christian. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Ben gave his testimony and he made the comment, I was born a Catholic. And you know, we kind of get a, oh, that's kind of funny, you're born a Catholic. But, but a lot of us were born Christians, you know, because we were born into a Christian household. Christian and I had both been to Bible college. <clears throat> so our kids had to be Christians, right? I mean, that's how it works. You're a Christian, you go to Bible college, you propagate the species, and you just burn <laughs> Christians. That's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> and so, I was not real thrilled about my son going to creation. They're going to have rock band. He's going to come back deaf. And he's going to come back liking music that makes him deaf. And he did. He came back liking music that makes but, uh, but okay, he's, he's gone. He's on the trip. And then he calls me up and he has the audacity to say, Dad, I got saved today. Like, you were saved a long time ago. Kind of happened. Possibly conception. <laughs> I, you know, I did one of those things where I was like, we'll talk about that when you get home. And I'm going to talk to Trevor, too. <laughs> and the next day he calls, Dad, I got baptized today. Okay, now I'm mad. <laughs> Trevor, I'm supposed to be a part of that for it to be official. That's how it works with God and me. Wait till you get home, young man. <laughs> and I got off the phone with him, and I looked at Christy, and Christy was like, oh, ooh. <laughs> so, they get home. They were a little bit late coming back. I think they are about half an hour, 40 minutes late coming back. So we were waiting for the call. Uh, when they came through Missoula, they gave us a call. We came down here. They actually got here before we did. And we pulled up, and I got my list. And I got temperature rising. And I pull up, and Benjamin comes out from behind the car, and the person that came out from behind the car carrying the bags was not the same person that I had put in the car to leave four or five days before. And my whole list went right out the window, and the temperature came down, and I went, oh my God, I've been lying, I've been deceived. And... Um, Benjamin had one of those experiences I often reference. There are only a few men in my life, a few people in my life that have a salvation experience where I have had the privilege to see it and their countenance changes. Their face looks different. And this led me to a dilemma. This gave me a big problem. Because I have five children. And my assumption was that 
Most of them at conception, definitely at birth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so Christian and I started talking, and, and we, we, we had a family meeting. I don't know how you guys do it, but we call a family meeting. And we have certain spots that people are supposed to sit, and, and we have a family meeting. And we ask the kids, we, we're confused now. Are you saved? Christopher, right off the bat, yep. And he knew the day, he knew the circumstances, he, right here, boom, okay. Benjamin, well, yeah, he's kind of the whole reason. Donovan, McKenzie, and Thaddeus, they couldn't give us an answer. I'll tell you what, that rocked my world. Because, I mean, they've grown up in church. Surely, I mean, you've gone to church camps, you've gone to VBS, you've been in Sunday school, you've done Christmas programs! <laughs> you mean we've had sinners doing Christmas programs? <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin spawned the rebirth of the other three. Because of them, Christy and I got on our knees, got on our faces, and prayed daily, God, save our children. And daily we are on our faces before God, praying, God, save our grandchildren. Yes. Amen. Especially after certain days. <laughs> God save them or they're coming home quick. <laughs> so, I just want to share with you, you know, that was really the reality of a cultural Christian versus a saved, a redeemed, a forgiven Christian for me when I saw the change in my kids. And, and you know, within uh, two years from the time Benjamin was saved, uh, Donovan, uh, you were in, what was it, July. Donovan was in November. Mackenzie was the following spring. Thaddeus was almost a year after Mackenzie. And, and I, I actually got to be a part of just Thaddeus's. All the other ones, I only got to see the change. But Thaddeus's, I, I actually got to lead that is, and that was a blessing to me. So, um, just an encouragement to you. Okay, I don't care how many stars your kids got for being in Sunday school. I don't care how involved they were with the youth program. I don't care uh, that they taught the younger kids. I, that doesn't matter because works don't entitle us to anything with God. It's just the embracing of his forgiveness, of his redemption. That's it. So, uh, thank you, Benjamin, for sharing with us. Um, it's a blessing. Each and every one of you that gets up and comes up, it's a blessing to me because it renews week by week my confidence that God is moving. You know, all too often we look around, we get caught up in the news. And I don't care whether it's CNN or Fox or MSNBC or any, any other news, but we get caught up in the junk of life. The yuck. Because that's newsworthy. Um, a Christmas story. The dad's sitting at the table reading a newspaper and he's laughing about some yazoo that swallowed a yo-yo on a bet. And his wife is like, why are they even reporting that? And he's offended. That's news! That's what we want to read about. And that's really what news is about in life today, isn't it? The, the yuck. I mean, oh, we get the little titillating, you know, the guy that walks around and hands out $100 bills for Christmas. Oh, isn't that sweet? But then we, what we jump to, you know, that what's that new game that the kids are playing now where they walk up and punch somebody and knock them out? The knockout game. You know, because that's more interesting to us. So, you guys are going to be absolutely amazed where we're going in the message today. <laughs> because we're going right back to where we were about three weeks ago. But we're going to take a different slant on it. Um, you know, we've been working our way slowly but surely, through Colossians. And we're in Colossians chapter 3. And you guys are going, wait a minute, this is, this is the Christmas season. This is going to be about Christmas. Don't get all excited. We're going to get there. So flip over to Colossians chapter 3 with you, if you would, please. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Now, 
I'm going to read the passage and I'm going to go back and explain. Okay? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Now we've taken quite a few weeks to go over these. We broke these down component by component. We've talked about what each of these means, what does it look like, how does it play out in our lives. And I'm coming back to this because all of this is given to us for a reason. It's not just God sat down one day with the Holy Spirit and His Son and they said, what what should a model Christian look like? Let's brainstorm here. Let's see. He should be, well, Semitic, of course. You know, got to have the dark curly hair, and they got to like olives. And, well, let's, let, well, what, what kind of characteristics should they have? Artists. They got to be an artist. They, well, oh, mathematics. They got to be good in math. They, they, didn't, they didn't do this, okay? And that's, that's kind of silly that we would even think that. But we kind of carry that same idea over to this list. It's not like God just sat down one day and decided to come up with the character attributes that he wanted from a Christian. The reason these attributes are so important, and, and this isn't the only place they're given, they're given in several other places in different orders. Some are added, some are removed. It's important because as a Christian, you should reflect who? Christ. So all of these things are character attributes. They're descriptions of the person of Christ, right? Now, like we say all the time, we're not doing this perfectly, we're doing it increasingly. I haven't met anyone yet that does this perfectly. None of you guys do all of these perfectly. Sorry, you're not perfect. I'm not even close to doing any of these perfectly. Some of them I'm just starting to do. I've never really saw them as being important. Joy. I, I'm still struggling to be convinced that a person has to have joy. I've gone through a great deal of my life without joy, and I've done fine so far. <laughs> but if God says that this is an attribute that He wants in me, then it should be something that should be being birthed in me. So, how is this a Christmas message? Let's go back to Luke chapter 2. Okay? I'm going to read Luke chapter 2, and then we're going to get into this. Thing. By the way, next week, we're doing a special service for Christmas. Um, we are going to have the kids in here because we're going to kind of change things up. We're going to do it different than we normally do our services. So make a point to be here next week because um, it's not going to be the same old, same old. We're going to do things a, a, a little bit more unique this time. So um, plan to be here next Sunday and, and celebrate one of the greatest gifts ever given. So we're, we're in Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his hometown. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him, laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Merry Christmas. Now, you know, I've, I've skipped a good part of this. I, I've skipped... <coughs> this much of the story. Right here. Because all of that comes before this. Alright? Because, because you understand 
The Old Testament was built as a foundation upon which the New Testament house is, is, is built. Okay? You understand that the Old Testament presented us with the dilemma that the New Testament addresses and resolves. The Old Testament sets up the idea that God created man to be sinless. And man chose otherwise. Sin came in and separated him from God. And all through the Old Testament, we see man's vain attempts to get back to God. We see God's attempts to point man in the right direction. We see God establishing his law. Why? Why did God give us a law knowing that we could never attain the full measure of the law? Why did he do that? Think neon signs. The law was a huge, flashing, neon sign of our need for a Savior. How far removed we are from the perfection and the holiness of God. I mean, even without the 600 plus additional laws that the good Jews established so that you wouldn't violate any of the original ones, we have a problem. We can't get here. There's this huge chasm between us. And it took quite a while for us to get the message. We're removed from God and we can do nothing to restore the relationship. So, all of this is coming before. All of this interspersed throughout it are prophecies saying, hey, oh, hey, there's hope coming. Don't fit. It's coming. I'm going to send one to you that will be able to repair the relationship. Hold on. Believe in me that this is good. Don't, don't. It's coming. That's like the kids at Christmas. I know the package is under there, but you can't open it yet. How many of you ever peeked at your presents? No. <laughs> I shake them. Okay, I'm going to share a story from my childhood. Mom and Dad went to the Navy Christmas party and they left the kids home. All five of us. <laughs> with all the presents under the tree. <laughs> Being the clever children that we were, we unwrapped every present under the tree, <laughs> found out what they were, and then rewrapped them. <clears throat> Being as stupid as we were, we didn't realize that our mom would understand that the presents had been unwrapped. So we knew everything that everybody was getting for Christmas. <laughs> mom and Dad took them all back. Oh. And bought us different presents. <laughs> Every single present under the tree went back to the store. <laughs> and we got different presents. <laughs> From that year on, my mom never put a person's name on a Christmas present. She put a number. And she had these, she had these ingenious <laughs> cryptologic numbers. This one says 647,352.7. <laughs> Who could that be? <laughs> we want to unwrap the present. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit later in, in the message. But you've got to understand, the birth, there was a lot of stuff that preceded this. Okay? As a matter of fact, the first chapter of Luke, it talks about John. And the promise of John being given to Zechariah and, and uh, oh, just Elizabeth. Elizabeth. There's Elizabeth. And so we have the promise. And then, and then the promise given to Mary. Hey, Mary, you're blessed among women. You know, I'll tell you, in the Protestant church, we really do a disservice to Mary. Now, the Catholic church, they deify her, and that's wrong. But in the Protestant church, we've gone too far the other direction. And we said, oh, she's just like everybody else. <clears throat> wrong. wrong. God chose her out of all of the women ever created before, during, after, ever will be created. God chose her. Blessed are you. We need to remember that. No, not to put a statue up and, and say, oh, we've got to pray to her so that she'll intercede on behalf of her violent son Jesus for us. No, no, we don't pray to Mary, but we understand that God blessed her. He chose her. So the promise was given to Mary. And then Joseph, wow, Joseph, talk about an unsung hero in the Bible, 
Joseph. Hey, Joe. Um, I know we're betrothed and all, and you know we haven't been married yet, but I'm pregnant. But it's not by any other guy. It's it God did it, and um, so there it is. And so Joseph now, now first, this is honorable enough, okay? Joseph first, being a man of honor, he's going to put her off quietly. He could have had her stoned. Because you don't get pregnant without certain things happening. And those certain things happening call for rocks to be lobbed in your general direction. But he doesn't do that. He's going to put her off quietly. Now, for somebody that never says a word in the Bible, God spoke a lot to Joseph. Joseph, don't do that. Joseph, do this. Joseph, go there. Joseph, go back there. God tells him, appears in a dream. Angel appears in a dream and says, no, I want you to marry her. Oh, okay. Some dream. Can you imagine how vivid that dream must have been for Joseph? Because, I mean, he's thinking about putting her off the next morning. He's like, all right, hey, let's get married. So, Joseph has to go to his hometown. They go down. Baby's time, time for the baby to be born. Manger, swaddling clothes, all, all of the, the typical Christmas thing. Now think about this for a minute. There was no room in the inn. Where did Jesus come from? Oh, come on. Paul says, what does it mean that he ascended except that he ascended? Where did he come from? He was already sitting in heaven, enthroned as the Almighty God. You know, remember our picture of heaven, the streets of gold, the, the, all the angels that do nothing but sing praises to Him because they understand He's worthy of nothing but praises. We, we, that's where He came from. Where everything that came into His presence came in on their knees, on their face. So, here he comes. Into a manger. Let's go back and start looking at our list again. Okay. Keep in mind, Luke. So, we're, we're back in Colossians chapter 3. It says, have compassionate hearts. Compassionate hearts. Why did Jesus come to be born in a manger? <laughs> Isaiah 53. I'm just going to read a couple verses. Don't flip there. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Is that not a compassionate heart? Why was Jesus come and born into a manger? Why did he come to be born at all? For me. For you. For all of those who would believe in him before and all of those who would believe in him after. He came for them. Why? Well, we're going to touch on that when we get to love. He had a compassionate heart. You think about the different things that happened. The different times that he healed. Moved by compassion, Jesus healed them. Why does he want us to have a compassionate heart? Because he has a compassionate heart. Kindness. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who have been, been bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's pretty kind. 
Christmas is all about kindness, right? This is one of the things I really don't like about Santa Claus. This is why I think God won up Santa Claus every time. Every time. He knows who's been naughty and he knows who's been nice. If you're on the naughty side, you get cold. If you're on the nice side, you get a bite. I never got a bite for Christmas. Ever. <laughs> I didn't get cold either. But I didn't know a heck of a lot of what I was getting on any particular Christmas. But God doesn't put that stipulation on the gifts that He gives. Because if He did, all of us would get nothing but coal. Because there's none of us that is nice. Look in the light and spectrum of God's holiness, God's perfection, His complete separateness from us. Okay? Keep that in mind when you use the measuring stick. Well, I'm better than that person. A giant among pygmies am I. <laughs> But the measuring stick is not the pygmies. The measuring stick is perfection, which is God. So, as far as I'm concerned, when you are celebrating Santa Claus, you've kind of reduced the value of Christmas to your own ability to earn your presence. I would rather have it celebrating God, who doesn't base it on my ability. He bases it on His kindness. His goodness. His agapeo love. That's what I would rather do. Again, because I'm kind of selfish and I want to get a gift. Kindness. Isaiah 63 says, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he has said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. The kindness of God. Um, you know, I don't know how many people were here how many of the women were here for the women's Bible study on Wednesday? But I know they spent quite a bit of time talking about kindness. You ever want a truly humbling experience? Do a word study on kindness. And find out what exactly that means. That's one of those words we kind of bleep when we read. We think we really have an understanding of it, but we don't. Because remember, it's not kindness according to the measure of the world. It's kindness according to the measure of God. And if you really want to find out how far removed we are from God, look at the depth of what each of these words really means in light of who God is. And then if you dare, measure yourself up against that standard. But keep in mind, not to leave you totally distraught, we are increasing day by day, week by week, year by year, we're increasing in these, that we become more and more like, and that's what the process of maturity becoming more and more like him. Okay? Remember also that the proverb says that a wise man falls seven times, gets back to his feet. I'm never going to be good at this kindness thing, so I quit. I'm going to go back to... I'm not good at any of them. Okay? It's maturity. Okay? We go step by step, little by little, little by little. God is faithful. God is faithful because if it depended on your ability to achieve these things, there would be no need for Him on the cross. We could have worked our, our own salvation. We could have done it on our own. And we wouldn't need Jesus. So we wouldn't be having Christmas or Resurrection Sunday. I think it works out much better this way. That He did it for him. So moving on. Humility. Wow. Humility. Think about this for a second. All right. Humility. Is humility an attribute of God who sees all things in truth and yet is perfect in all things? How can he be humble? What's there to be humble about? 
He does everything right every time. He not only scores perfect on his test, but he gets all the extra credit ones too. And then corrects the teacher's false test. What's there to be humble about? Is God humble? Yes. <clears throat> well, yeah. And that's what's so cool. He's not asking anything of us that he has not already done and is not already. Okay? Let's, let's look at this. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay. Now this is a prophecy more than 400 years before Christ. Now, problem? Yeah, this is a problem because the Jews weren't looking for a humble Messiah. They were looking for the white horse Messiah coming in with the sword to purge Israel of Rome and everyone else. Let's get rid of all these sinners, Jesus. We're with you. No, you're not because you're the sinner that I'm coming to save. You need the donkey first. I've got to come humble before I can come proud. Humble. He is humble. Not because he's on a donkey. The donkey doesn't make him humble. He's on the donkey because he is humble. I love this one. Okay. Philippians 2. This, this is one of my favorite passages. You guys have heard me quote this a number of times. I'm going to flip over. I'm going to read the whole section to you. This actually comes on the tails of the passage that we looked at last week. I'm going to back up. I'm going to read that passage and I'm going to go through. So, uh, Colossians, or Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count each other as more significant than yourselves. Let each, okay, did you, did you catch that? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Do you see those two things are opposite? Do you, do you get that? That if, if you're not acting in humility, it's because of selfish ambition or conceit. Now, what is conceit? We're thinking that you're all that. Look, measure yourself against the one that is worthy to be measured against. You know, I guarantee you, every single one of you in here is better at basketball than me. I bet you Vivian could outshoot me. <laughs> okay? I've never been able to play basketball. You know, we had to do in, in sixth grade, we had to do the 30 second shots into the basket. And they're like, you know, they're like 30, 31, 32. I'm like, <laughs> got one. Time's up. Oh. Okay, Mr. Bando, maybe you could go run some laps. Conceit is thinking you got it when, again, you're a giant among pygmies. <clears throat> If you're not humble, it's because you have selfish ambition or conceit. Now let's keep reading. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. That'll take the conceit right out of you. So don't get cocky about basketball, baby. <laughs> Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Having this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. Okay, now here's where it gets cool. Okay. I love this. Who, referring to Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
That right there is cool. Okay? Because what he's saying is, even though Jesus was God, he knew that we couldn't get a hold of that. We couldn't understand that. We would have a hard time wrapping our brains around that. He emptied himself. Now, was did that mean that he wasn't fully God when he came to earth? No. He emptied himself by will. Uh, remember what he told Pilate? What, what, you think that if I didn't want, I could get myself out of this? Do you think you have any authority over me? It wasn't, you wouldn't have it except that God gave it to you. I could have thousands of angels here in a minute, bub. <clears throat> he willingly chose not to use what was his by right. He emptied himself. Now, now check this out. We're talking about being born in a manger. Okay? Now, here's the king of the world that even the greatest palace at the time would have been considered Hubble, for sort, beside what he came from. I mean, like we're talking dirty shack, garbage. Caesar's palace was insufficient for him. He takes on the form of a servant. He didn't even come as a king. He didn't even come as a governor. He didn't even come as a mayor. He didn't even come as church leadership. He came as a servant. Being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, fully God, fully man, the incarnation of Christ, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Is God humble? You betcha. See, this is the mystery of the Trinity here. Who is he being humble to? Well, to the full nature of the Trinity of God. The Father has sent him on our behalf. And he humbled himself. Remember in the garden? He says, God, I don't want to do this. If it's possible, let another way be found. Most of us would have ended our prayers right there. But he said, but not as I will, but as you will. I will do as you desire of me. He humbled himself, knowing what was coming. But the story doesn't end there. The story doesn't end there. Therefore, what do we have to ask when you start a verse with that? What is the therefore, therefore? Why is it therefore? Because it's connecting to what came before. Because of all of this, therefore... God has, ex has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <coughs> Do you get that? See, you don't have a choice whether to accept him as Lord. He is. The only choice you have is when. You can accept him as Savior, and by that you acknowledge him as Lord. And see, that's where we get into the trouble with cultural Christians. We want him as Savior to get our rumps out of the fire, but we refuse to accept his Lordship. We don't want to humble ourselves to do as he says we should do. Because even though all the failures in our life has led us to the point of the cross, Somehow or another, we think that if he forgives us, we can keep the reins and do better after. Doesn't work that way. Okay? If you come to Christ expecting him to be anything less than Lord, you have come not to be a Christian. And I would say your salvation is suspect. Okay? I say that from personal experience because I would, hey man, I'm a smart dude. I can figure this stuff out and I mess it up every time. And even when I do it right, then I get puffed up. Lose, lose. 
Humble yourself. Because he humbled himself. It's the nature of God. Now this is what's really cool. Every time we confess that he is Lord to the glory of his Father. Isn't that cool? That even in his exaltation, he is still bringing glory to the Father. Wouldn't it be so easy, as Lucifer tried to do, to say, okay, now I'm exalted. Bring the praise to me. Bring the glory to me. But that's not what Jesus does. He says, no, 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 no. The glory is to the Father. It's his. Because of what he's done, what he has allowed. Okay? That's humility. How does God be humble? He's perfect. He submits to his own will. Think that's easy? Try Weight Watchers. <laughs> well, I'm serious. We have a difficult time just sticking to a diet plan. Or, how about this? Try getting up an hour early so you can spend an hour in prayer and meditation before you go to work. We have difficulty submitting to ourselves. God does not. Okay? So let's go on. Oh my gosh. Okay. Meekness. You guys remember what our working definition for weakness is? Meekness, huh? <clears throat> Strength under control, right? Meekness is not weakness. Again, go back to what we just talked about with Jesus. Here's God incarnate. They're going to put him on a cross. He chose to allow it to happen. That's meek. He had the strength. He had the wherewithal to prevent that from happening. But he chose not to. That's meekness. Strength controlled. Meekness. If they strike you upon the one cheek, turn and present to them the other also. When you strike me on the cheek, dude, I'm going to dislocate your shoulder. No. We turn and present to them strength under control. Strength under control. Meekness. Isaiah 53, 7. No, nope, sorry. Matthew 20. You say, wow, because Jesus wasn't there in Isaiah. Matthew 20, 25 to 28. But Jesus called to them, uh, called to them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. See, the whole economy of God is backwards to the way we think of things. Actually, that's kind of arrogant for me to say it that way, isn't it? Really, it's the way we do things is backwards to the way God does things, because he did it right first. We think that in order to be in a position of authority and leadership, we have to have many servants to do our will. God says, no, 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 that, that's not how it works with me. In order for you to be a leader in my body, you got to be the servant. You want to be first, you got to be last. You want to lead, you got to serve. This is the example that he set. See? Did you catch that right there at the, at the end there? Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. There's the example for us. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. What an example of meekness. Do you think you could have done that and not opened your mouth? I've been finding scriptures like, hey, give a ready defense. I'm innocent! It wasn't me! But he didn't open his mouth. Why? Why did Jesus not open his mouth? Do you ever wonder that? Why did he go silently? Me. It was for our sake that he didn't open his mouth. Why? Think about this for a minute. He could have said whatever he wanted, it would have come to pass. I wish Pilate 
put in He could have done whatever he wanted. He is the Word of God. He is the Word of God. It is by his conscious thought that everything holds together. Now think about that as he's getting whipped and scourged and beaten. I'm sorry guys, but if that had been me, everything would have been undone. I would have whoosh, everything would have been gone. He didn't open his mouth for our sakes. He needs. Okay? There's the example. Patience. Second Peter. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Aren't you glad that God is patient? I know I am. That he has so much patience with me. You know, um, several of our grandchildren, this is their first Christmas around, well, it's their first Christmas. So, it's the first time they've seen a tree, it's the first time they've seen lights, and little bangly things that dangle, and, and being little, what do they want to do? Ooh. <laughs> But we are patiently instructing them. No, don't do that. Don't. And it's kind of interesting because the younger one is like, you can't touch this. You come over here and play with me. The old one is like, Titus, you touch that again, I'm going to thump you wrong. <laughs> Isn't that the way God is with us? You know, the little ones are like, God, you just picked that one up and, and redirected them. Why did I get whacked? You're old enough to know better. You know? Aren't you glad for his patience, his patient endurance, that he deals with us from an attitude of patience? Now, here's, here's one thing that I thought was really cool. I'm tying this right back to Christmas. Okay? Galatians 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, when the time was right, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Do, do you get that? Do you get that? Why could Jesus not have been born like right before the exile and delivered him from Babylon or, or, or Assyria? Or why couldn't it have been born in the intertestamental period and, and you know, like done the whole thing with Antiochus IV Epiphanes or, or maybe right before Rome came in? And Why? Because the God waited until the perfect time. When the time was right. When the fullness of time had come. He didn't rush it. He knew when the best time was. We, we, we talked about that last year. Do you know how many things have to work in place on a global scale for the miracle of Christianity to come to be? You know that? I mean, just the fact that the Romans were in power, that the Roman Empire was in place, had to happen so that the gospel could spread from one end of the earth to the other end? Do, do you know that? So that they could speak it in Jerusalem and in the same language speak it in Spain and it would be understood. God wasn't idle. He, he was setting things in place and when the timing was perfect, He put it into play. Forgiveness. I struggle with this one a little bit. No, I struggle with it often. Matthew 6, 14, 15. This is, Jesus is wrapping up the, the sample prayer. And he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father uh, forgive your trespasses. Now, uh, let me make this clear. This is not a salvation message. Right here. This, is, this is not a salvation passage. What this is, is... Uh, an indication of where you are. Okay. Jesus is setting a principle here so that you can know where you're at. Because when you come to salvation, if you understand, if you really comprehend the full measure of what you have been forgiven, what is anybody else's offense against you? Really? I mean, okay, the guy cut me off. You know, he took my spot. I circled the parking lot seven times for that spot, and he took it. 
Really? Uh, there's no beatings in that. There's no scourgings in that. There's no death of an innocent in that. If we really understand, if we really comprehend, if we can open up our minds to the level of forgiveness that God has granted us, the measure of offense that we have given Him, and the forgiveness that completely overwhelms that, there should be nothing that we would be unwilling to forgive. Nothing. Well, you don't know what that person did to me. God does. And it was an offense to Him first. You realize nothing that has hurt you except that it hurt him first? Nothing. That's the measure. What can you hold against someone? Just look, look a little bit further. Romans 5.8. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I think I just skipped, didn't I? I just skipped. We'll come back to that one. We'll jump back up here, Luke 23, 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's on the cross. He is at death's door. He has been ravaged completely falsely. He has been beaten. He's been scourged. He had to lug a wooden cross. They nailed him to the cross and they raised him up. And Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Who's he got in mind here? Who's he thinking about? Maybe he might even be thinking about that Sanhedrin that condemned him to die and manipulated things so that he would die that way. I think so. God forgive him. Because see, when he came, he came that forgiveness might be extended to all. That's the measure of his grace. Right? Where sin abounds, grace more abounds. That's the measure of his forgiveness. Love. I love this. John 3, 16, 17. Love. For God so loved the world. The world. The world. Now, now you understand that that word does not mean like the physical earth. It's talking about the people that populate the earth. That you and me. The Muslims over there blowing things up. The people that are burning down churches in the Middle East. That person at work that says mean things to you and just as a jerk. God so loved them that he didn't leave them to die in their sins. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, only one, that anyone who would believe in him, anyone who would believe in him, anyone. That's why I like testimonies so much. If you get an opportunity, go out and look on the internet for some testimonies. There are some incredible testimonies. I, I watched a video a testimony of a young man that was sent by um, the Muslim world into the U.S. to find places to blow up, to launch terrorist attacks. That was his job. He was coming in, he was scouting out. <coughs> and he was in a car accident. And his, I mean, like, bad. Things were broken from head to toe. And when he was going to be discharged from the hospital, there was no one to come and take care of him because he couldn't take care of himself. So the doctor, the physician who had been taking care of him, <clears throat> took him home. Now, talk about a divine appointment because this doctor was a Christian. 
And this Muslim comes into this Christian home with the understanding that they hate us, they're out to kill us, they're, they're disgusting people, God doesn't love them, and yet he invites this man into his home, and, and this, this man becomes part of his family. And as he continues to heal, this doctor works with him, and, and he shares with them, and, and they talk about their respective faiths. And, and the one thing that kept coming up was the fact that the, the Christian God is a God of love. And he wants people to serve him out of love, not out of fear. And things go on, and, and, and the, the doctor buys him a car so he can get back and forth to work because his car was destroyed. The time comes for this man to go home. And he goes home, and he goes, and he grabs a gun, and he sits on his knees in the sunlight. And he says, I don't understand this. All my life I've been told these people are evil. And yet when my time of need came, they were the ones that stood up and helped me. I don't understand this. Allah, if you are real, you need to speak to me now. Nothing. And he contemplated putting the gun to his head and ending his life. And he said, okay, if Allah is not real, God of my friend, I want you to show yourself to me. And he had this peace just overwhelm him. He said it was like a blanket just draped around him. And, and he said, there were no voices, but he said, I knew there was someone there. And that day he gave his heart to the Lord. That day he gave his heart to the Lord. And now he has become a missionary <clears throat> to those same people that sent him to come over and wreak havoc. He's had death threats against him. He's had to change his name. He's had to, he, he basically lives on the run. His family has disowned him. They want nothing to do with him. As a matter of fact, if they were ever to come into contact with him, he would be lucky if they didn't kill him. That's why I love testimonies. Because it's the power of God at work in us. Okay? Now, by the way, do you suppose that if God didn't love the Muslims, he would have gotten saved? Hmm. Keep in mind, um, our views are oftentimes tainted by our political ideology, our cultural affiliations. Okay? We need to work to overcome those things. Okay? But God shows his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know if any of you ever came to the cross perfect, but I didn't. I came with a bunch of baggage and mess and junk and nasty stuff. And God loved me enough to die for me while I was carrying all of that garbage with me. And then took it away. Okay? That's his love. Now, now keep in mind, agapeo, we talked about that before. This is the kind of love that we are supposed to have for others. Right? Right? It, it's easier to bear forgiveness towards someone that has offended you if you love them unconditionally. If the love that you have for them is not based on what they did or didn't do. It's based on who you have. Right? That, that, that's a lot easier to work from. I'm just going to hit a couple real quick. I, I know I've gone a little bit longer today. Uh, peace and joy. And, and joy was not in our list, but I put it in here anyway because it's Christmas. And because I get to them, I'm allowed to do kind of stuff. Like that. So, but it is in Galatians. It's in the list in Galatians. So I'm not just making it up. All right? Joy. <clears throat> Luke 2, 8-14. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them. And they were filled, filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Wow. Great joy. Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Who? Who is it for? All the people. Who is it not for? Well, then it's for everyone. Okay? The good news is for everyone. Great joy for everyone. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. See, he didn't grow into being Lord at the cross. He already was Lord. Okay? 
who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, do you catch the difference there? One, the good news is for everyone. But his peace is only for those with whom he is pleased. You catch that? You catch that? Who is God pleased with? Those whom have believed. Those whom have exhibited faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Right? So, his peace is among those whom exhibit faith. Right? Do you follow my thinking there? So, should we have peace? Well, if you have faith, you should have peace. Right? So joy and peace, wrapped up right there. Real quick, and be thankful. I found three times, just boom, 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 that Jesus was thankful. What did Jesus have to be thankful for? I mean, he's God, right? What does he have to be thankful for? John chapter 11. His friend Lazarus has died. Okay. What's he being thankful for? He says, uh, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for their sake. What is he thankful for? That he, has, he has open and constant communion with the Father. The same thing we have. Did you ever think about being thankful that you can come here in prayer at any time? Matthew 14, 19. The feeding of the 5,000. He said, Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples. And one it says, and gave thanks. He gave thanks. Now, we, from this, we kind of get our, our blessing of the food. You know, it's kind of funny because Christians tend to do it before the meal. Other cultures do it after the meal. Which I always found funny because it's almost the way. You don't trust God's going to let you eat it? <laughs> God, we thank you for this food. Whoa, what happened? But the, Okay. But he, he broke and he gave thanks. Final one. They're in the upper room. And he took the bread. And when he had given, given thanks... He broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Communion. We have him three times giving thanks. One, he's at the grave of his friend. Resurrection is coming. Two, he's got 5,000 men plus women and children. So, I mean, even if each guy only brought a wife and a child, we're looking at 15,000 people. If I had been there, and I was the average, you know, it would have been, well, let's see, 5,000 times 6 more than 30,000, so about 35,000, right? And he gives thanks for this little bit of food. God, we thank you for this food. Oh, look, it's multiplying. Miracle, miracle, miracle. The last time... Communion. He's long to have the supper with them. He breaks the bread and he gives thanks. And then tells them, this is my body broken up for you. He set an example for us. Giving thanks. Being a people of thanksgiving. Why are we to have these fruits in our lives? Why? Because God does. If God is living in you, you should exhibit the same fruit that he has. Okay? You know, you, you fill up a balloon with something, and you punch a hole in it, what's going to come out? What you filled it up with, right? You soak a sponge in something, you pick it up and wring it, what's going to come out? Whatever you put into it, right? So, if you want the fruit on the outside, you've got to have God on the inside. You've got to have His Spirit 
birthing these things in you. Yeah, we, you know, we've got to set ourselves up in such a way that those things can be birthed in us. But really, without His Spirit, it's never going to happen. It's going to be, be a pale, frail imitation. So, going back to Jesus, born in a manger. King of kings, Lord of lords. The almighty creator of everything. And he comes as a servant. I mean, not even a servant in a wealthy household. He comes as a servant of the poor. They, they can't even get in the inn. Their roommates are barnyard animals. That's, you know, what would have been eating out of the trough that he was laid in. Allow God to work in you as he will. You will be all the better for it. All the better. People will like you more. Well, that's, I, I, let, me, let me put that as a caveat. Some people won't like you more. And that's good. Because Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Okay, but they're not going to hate you for how you're acting. They're going to hate you for how they're acting. Because you're not doing the stupid things they're doing. Allow God to birth His Spirit in you to renew in you those things that are His. Amen?